Good morning. And happy Sabbath to everyone. So I don't know which microphone is being used, but I'm using this one, so I'm just going to put that right there. Well, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Fernando Villegas. I am the pastor uh, here in Freeport of the South Church and the Spanish Church, just recently uh, taking on the Spanish Church as well. And, uh, but it is a, a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful privilege for me to be here with you this morning. Um, about last, it was around this time last year, in fact, I think it was that uh, Pastor Farmer uh, extended me this invitation to uh, come preach here. And so I'm very happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, you know, when you're a pastor, you got a church, you got two churches, you don't often get to see some of the other churches in town. And so it's nice to uh, nice to be here. I have been here a couple times, uh, probably uh, for uh, different programs that we've had with the school. So, um, but uh, it, it's nice to be able to be here uh, with you this morning. I have here uh, my family uh, with me, which I always, anytime I can have my family with me when I'm preaching, that's always a blessing. So uh, for those of you who may not know my family, my wife, Mila, is right there. And uh, she, she'll stand, she could just wait, but she'll stand, that's good too. And then our two boys, uh, Michael and Jonathan. Y'all know Andrew, he's not ours, but uh, he spends a lot of time with us though. Uh, yeah, very good friends with, with my boys. But uh, those are my boys, Michael and Jonathan. And we also have a daughter, uh, 18 years old daughter. She's a, a freshman this year at Southwestern. She just barely started Southwestern uh, in the fall. So she's pretty excited about that. In fact, we're gonna go pick her up uh, for the Christmas break next week. I'm gonna go pick her up, so. Uh, we'll have her with us for, uh, for, for a good amount of time. Uh, that's kind of the nice thing about college. They give you these long Christmas breaks. That's kind of nice. Uh, so uh, we will have her with us uh, soon. But uh, we're just very excited. Thank you very much for this invitation to be uh, with you here this morning. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, to spending some time with you this morning. Uh, I, I, I stood up here to this, uh, this little pulpit here to preach. And uh, most of you may probably not know this. There's a little sign here, which I like. I don't know who put it or how long that's been there, but it's a good reminder. It says, sir, we would see Jesus. I like that. You got you to gotta be reminded of that when you stand up here. That everything we do, may Jesus be exalted and magnified and glorified. Amen. So um, before we uh, move on with the sermon, uh, just want to let, I invite you to open up your scriptures uh, for our scripture reading this morning. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah, if you don't uh, know where the book of Zephaniah is, just look for that spot in your Bible that's pretty, that's the, the kind of probably the cleanest part of your Bible. Uh, right before Matthew. Uh, you know, after Matthew it gets a little bit kind of, you know, your, your thumbs are, are kind of messing it up and then before that, but it's, a, it's one of those minor prophets. Zephaniah is one of those, you know, sneeze and you miss it books. So, so no one sneezes right now. But uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, and we will be reading with, uh, beginning with verse 14. Zephaniah chapter 3. And uh, I invite you to read along with me, beginning with verse 14, continuing on to the end of the book. It's a short book here. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. By the way, if you have it, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. 
I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Verse 20, at that time, I will bring you home at that time when I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Let us bow our heads forward of prayer. Dear Jesus, be glorified in our midst at this moment. This is our prayer. Amen. I, uh, I was assured uh, earlier as I was uh, in the little elders room as we were getting ready for worship service, I was assured that our uh, AV people up upstairs are able to handle someone who likes to walk around because I like to walk around so there's a little bit of heads up right there uh, hopefully uh, y'all can uh, keep up but uh, I'd like to invite you uh, we read Zephaniah I'd like to invite us now to go to the book of Luke chapter 15 Luke chapter 15 and beginning with verse 1 and um, our focus is going to be on the latter part of the chapter. But I want us to get these first uh, three verses in so we can see the context in which uh, this story takes place. Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. We're going to read the first three verses and then we'll skip ahead to verse 11. But uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, we read as follows. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. Speaking about Jesus, they were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And we'll stop right there real quickly, just so we can get the, the, get, get the setting, get the scenery in our mind. Jesus is there. He's talking, he's, he's preaching. He's fellowshipping with a whole bunch of unsavory characters, uh, according to the religious leaders. You know, they were the tax collectors, which, by the way, you know, no one's ever liked paying taxes. Well, that's not new. No one's ever liked the IRS. But especially in this culture, where they had a very, uh, probably well-earned reputation for corruption, for, for you know, bribery, for stealing from the people, you know, taking more than what was charged. And so they did not have a very good uh, reputation. So you had these tax collectors and all other sorts of sinners. And we just look at the Gospels and we read through and we see what kinds of people they were. They were prostitutes. They were, they were people that weren't, they didn't follow all the rules, all the traditions, all the customs of the Pharisees who were very, they were very strict. They were very, this is how it has to be. And they would gather with Jesus, and he would eat with them. And so the Pharisees and the scribes would get upset. Because they would say, well, what's Jesus doing with all these you know, unsavory people? There's a phrase in, uh, in Spanish, and I don't know, I, I, it, may, it may be in English as well, but uh, the Spanish phrase uh, translated into English is basically, tell me who you are with, and I will tell you who you are. You know, tell me who you hang around with, and that's the kind of person that you are. And, you know, many of us probably who are parents have kind of said the same thing. We tell them to, to, to be careful who you're hanging around with because who you're hanging around with, that's who you are. Well, guess who Jesus hang around with? All the wrong people. And so the Pharisees would see that and they would say, well, if he's hanging around with them, he must not be very good. And so verse 3 says that in response to this, he told them this parable. And it actually goes on to tell three parables, three different stories of things that were lost and were eventually found. 
And it's this third one that I want to pay attention to this morning. Luke chapter 15, and we're going to start from verse 11. Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. It says this. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. How many sons did the man have? Two sons. You know, we kind of forget about the second one, but, but he'll get back to him. There was a man who had two sons. Verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the paws that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the robe, the best one, and put it on him. And put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Every single one of those three parables in Luke chapter 15 has that same climax. That's the, that's, that's the punchline. That's, that's where all these parables are leading. When that which is lost has been found, there is a celebration. And let me tell you something this morning. The, the extent of our celebration... Uh, is a reflection on the value that we place on that which had been lost. When I was, uh, I went to school at Southern Adventist University. And um, when I went to, off to college, 18 years old, just, you know, I was 18 year old kid. I never left El Paso. That's where I'm from. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. Born and raised there. I had, you know, I'd, yeah, I'd gone on vacation and stuff like that, but I never lived anywhere else. And so this was my, my first time living away from home, living without my parents. <coughs> excuse me. My, my father, uh, my brother, excuse me, my brother had also attended Southern. In fact, he had just graduated uh, a few months earlier. And so um, he was going to help me drive. I was, we were going to take my car, uh, and he was going to help me drive over to Tennessee. And before I left home, my father, you know, he, he, put, he pulled me aside. He gave me some last, uh, you know, you know, last minute, you know, words of advice, fatherly advice. But he also gave me some money. He gave me a, a good amount of cash. I don't remember how much it was, but it was, it was a, a good amount of cash. He said, you know, I didn't have a credit card at this time. I didn't have anything. I, all I had was just, you know, that cash, you know. Uh, and my, my father said, you know, this is for emergencies. Okay, this is, this is very important. This is for emergencies. It's not for you to go out and party and do all this. You know, this is for if something happens to the car, you know, you tire, you know, you buy new tires. Like, this is for emergencies. So you need to make sure that you put it somewhere very safe. Because if you don't put it somewhere safe, someone could see it. They could take it or you'll lose it, whatever. So, you know, being the, the good, dutiful son that I was, I said, well, I'm going to take him seriously. I'm going to, you know, make sure that I put this money somewhere safe. Huh? And, and, and I thought, where can I put it that it would be very safe? And, and I thought and I thought and I said, yeah, I, this is exactly where, where I should put it. And, and I put it in a place that was very safe. This place, was, th th this place where I put the money was, was super, super safe. It was so safe, even I couldn't find it later. That's how safe the money was. No one, including me, was going to touch that money. Because <laughs> it was safe. I looked for that money all over. 
you know, for days, weeks. I, you know, I didn't, I, unfortunately, I didn't needing it. You know, I went through the whole year and I was good. But, but you know, when I, when, I, when I just wanted to check to see if, if, it was, if the money was fine, I couldn't find it. I looked and looked. I'm living in a dorm. It's not that big. There's only so many places it could be. And yet I couldn't find it. So the year goes by. Praise the Lord. Didn't have any emergencies. Didn't need it. Um, it's time to go ahead back uh, to El Paso for the summer, getting my, putting my books up, my clothes, getting everything ready. And for some reason, I just decide, I don't even know why, I even, but just decide to open up one of my books. And I open up the book. And guess what was stashed inside? The money. It was a lot of money. Very valuable. What do you think my reaction was? You know, did, I, did I look at the money and say, huh, look at that, that's where it is. And then just close the book and go on my day? No! I celebrated! I rejoiced! I said, yes, the money has been found! Praise the Lord! I was happy we were having a party. I was like, you know, I told my roommate, let's go party with this money. Like, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> but I, there was rejoicing. Why? Because something that was of a lot of value had been found. Every single one of these parables is designed to show us that something valuable has been lost. And now it is found. A coin, a sheep, and right now a son. A son, oh, by the way, think about this. The son goes up to his father. And he says, Dad, give me my inheritance. Most of you are probably aware, and we got the trust services guy with us, praise the Lord, you know, specialized, you know, uh, uh, knowledge here. When is it that you usually gain an inheritance? When, when do you usually receive it? Well, when the person has died. That is typically how inheritances work. So the so this, this, this young man goes up to his father and says, you know what, you know, Tick tock, tick tock. You're not, you're not dying anytime soon. I want to enjoy the money now. Hey, I'm young. You know, there's no time like the present. That's you know, I, I, I don't want to wait until you die or you have all this money. I, I want it now. Give it to me now. Can I have it now? Basically, essentially saying, I kind of wish you were dead. Every time, excuse me. I'm getting too excited here. Yeah, slow down. Slow down. Every time I read this story, I really think about it. I never cease to be amazed by this detail. The father does it. He gives him the money. I'm glad the story wasn't written about me. Because if it had been written about me, you know, father, give me the inheritance, I would have said, forget you, you know. You wait till you wait. You, know, you wait till I'm gone. Then you can have the money. The father gives it to him. He gives him the money. He probably knew what he was going to do with it. He knew, he knew his son. We know our kids. You know, we know. We have a pretty good idea what they will do in given circumstances. Which is why sometimes we don't allow them to be in those circumstances. And, and yet... He gives it to him. The amazing grace of a father who gives us more than we deserve, to be honest. And, and, and the son takes this money. The Bible says he goes off to a far country. He's squandering. He's living. By the way, what, you know, he's got a lot of friends. And when you, have, when you have money, you got friends. You know, you got cash. And you got all these people around you. And you're going to... Do this, and you go to the bars and the parties and this and that. You're spending money, and everything, everything is great, everything is wonderful. It's all great. Until, until the money's gone. And until there's a famine in the land. And until you find yourself no money, and by the way, the money leaves, the friends leave along with it. And you find yourself 
in the middle of pigs. He, he was reduced to a job taking care of pigs. And let me tell you, for a Jew, that was perhaps the ultimate humiliation. You're taking care of pigs. And you're looking at, and he's, look, he's looking at what they eat. And the Bible says he desired to, to fill his stomach with, with, with the paws that they were eating. How, how, how many, have you ever seen what pigs eat? How many have seen what pigs eat? Raise your hand if you've seen what, you've seen what pigs eat. What do they eat? Slop. That's what pigs eat. It is nasty. I have been hungry at times in my life. I'll be honest. I have been hungry. There have been moments where like, oh man, I could eat anything right now. But I, that's an exaggeration. That's not true. I have never been hungry enough that I would look at what pigs eat and say, you know what? You put some ketchup on that, I think it would be okay. That's, that's, you're, you're, you're in a pretty bad spot when you're wanting to eat what the pigs eat. And, and I want you to picture... This young man, just kind of there, rock bottom, in the middle of all these pigs around him. He's looking at them. He's wanting to eat. He's so hungry. He's like, I don't even eat that much. And the Bible says, and I love that phrase, he came to himself. He looked around like, what am I doing here? The servants who work for my father have plenty of food to eat and I, his son, am starving to death in the middle of all these pigs. What in the world am I doing here? You see, that young man had forgotten that he was a son. And the most important characteristic about being a son is that you have a father. There are no sons without fathers. Now, you, so there are sons who never knew their fathers for whatever reason, but you had one at some point. You came from somewhere. You came from something that was there before you, something bigger than you. This son forgot that until he looked around himself and said, what in the world am I doing here? And then he says, it's time to go back home. And he makes up this little speech in his mind. He says, I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to, yeah, I don't even deserve to be a son anymore. But I'm going to go, I'm going to plead, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for mercy. I'm like, at least hire me as a servant. Even if I don't deserve to be your son anymore, hire me as a servant. At least I can eat. At least I have somewhere to sleep. And so he goes walking back home. And the, and the scripture says that his father sees him while he is far away. He sees him while he's far away. You see, he's been looking out for his son every day. Every day he's been looking out for him. Walks out the door, sees someone passing by. Is that him? Is that no? It's like, what about that guy? What about that guy? He's no, too tall, too short, too ugly. I don't know. Until one day, he's looking out. He's about that height. He's light color hair. He looks like him. He's getting closer. He's getting closer. He's still far away. But he recognizes. And he knows. That's it. That's him. He's back! And he goes running to him. Now I'll tell you this, this is a culture, older, respected men did not run. 
You didn't have these, you know, today you, everyone runs, you got joggers and stuff like that, everyone runs, presidents run, you know, all these people run. You know, in that culture, you know, you're, you're, you're old, you're, you're respected, you got a family, you got a household, you got a reputation. I don't need to run, what do I have to run for? I don't run. That man ran. It, 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 it was not, it, it was a humbling experience. But he ran. Because that's how much he loved his son. He goes chasing after his son. He goes hugging him and kissing him. And then and the son starts, he starts to give his speech. Father, forgive me, I've sinned against heaven and raised before you. And then don't even finish that speech. Father, no, 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 none of that. And he immediately calls forth for the servants and says, come quickly. Before anyone sees him. Because by the way, you, you got to know, this guy looked pretty bad. This kid smelled nasty. This kid did not look presentable. Before anyone could see his shame. Because by the way, you know, I am pretty sure that everyone in town knew what had happened. We like to gossip. You know, people, that's, that's kind of like, some, sometimes for some of us, you know, it's kind of second nature. We talk about sins. You know, there, there are the, 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 the heathen bad sins, you know. We, we know that, cheating and murder and all that stuff. Sometimes we forget, forget about the respectable sins, which are gossip. Sometimes we, 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 we gossip, but we spiritualize. We say it's a prayer request. Please pray for our brother so-and-so. He's, this is happening to him. No, really? You don't say. Oh, you do say. Okay, wow. You know, everyone knew that the kid had, had, had left. Before they see that son return in shame, dress him up. Make him look presentable. Make him look like he's my son again. Put on the robe. Put on my finger. Put on shoes. And let's kill the fat calf and let us rejoice and celebrate. My son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. And the Bible says they all began to celebrate. Praise the Lord. Party time. Now, with the other two parables, that's where the story ends. But remember, Jesus is telling these parables. He's speaking to the Pharisees. And so here he's going to continue because we don't know how the other sheep responded when that one sheep was lost and it was found. You know, I'm sure the sheep were like, all right, bad, whatever. And the coin, the other coins, the, the, the nine coins that, that they didn't get lost, they didn't know anything. They were just their coins. But there was another son. There's two sons. Don't forget about the second son. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 and beginning with verse 25. <clears throat> now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother is coming. Your father has killed the fat calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry. That's the first time, by the way, that there's anger in this story. All throughout, until this point, every joy, 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 celebrate, 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 party, party, party. All of a sudden, someone is not partying. You're supposed to party. No, I'm angry. He became angry. Verse 28, Luke 15, 28. He became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Who's speaking this again? Who's saying this? It was, it was the second son. It was, it was the second, it wasn't one of his slaves. It was the second son. You know, the younger son had forgotten that he was a son. It seems like the older son had forgotten that as well. All these years I've been working as a slave for you. 
And I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The son forgot he was a son. He was so caught up in obeying and serving and working for his father, he forgot he wasn't a slave. He was a son. I read a story several years back, and most likely it's not true, but it's an interesting story. It's kind of humorous, and it proves my point, so I'll share it. About a young man who's getting ready to get married. He's engaged. He's making all the arrangements, all the plans. He's very excited. And he, uh, you know, he, he makes a reservation at, at, at the nicest hotel in town for their wedding night. He goes up to the manager and says, I want the most romantic, I want your honeymoon suite. Oh, yeah, we have this wonderful honeymoon suite. It is, it is, it is romantic, it's great, we'll fix it up real nice. You know, a little heart-shaped bed, silk sheets, we'll put rose petals there, candles, we'll have a little violinist playing, it'll be fun, it'll be nice. You'll like it. Oh, and the guy was so excited. Oh, this sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you got to pay in advance. All right, here it is. So the wedding day comes. They have the wedding. They have the reception. Party, party. Reception's over. Time to go to the hotel. They go to the hotel. It's late. They get the key. They go upstairs. They open up the room. And it's the saddest thing you've ever seen in your life. Tiny, tiny little room. I mean, just, you know, it's probably about the size of just this platform. Just, not even the little choir section back there. Just, just this right here. And it uh, doesn't even have a bed. It's got one of those sofa couches. That's sad. And the, the guy was upset. He was angry. He was like, how is this possible? And like, you know, I paid a lot of money for a honeymoon suite, and they, they give us this, this little tiny room. doesn't even have a bed, just a sofa couch. And he was mad, but, you know, manager was gone. Uh, it was late. All the rooms were already full. They couldn't put him in another room, so. You got to spend your honeymoon night, your wedding night, on a sofa. But the following day, the guy was, you know, the he, he, uh, first thing in the morning, he went to speak to that manager. And he was complaining. He was angry. He was like, I, I paid a lot of money. You promised me this. And I didn't have it. You know, you didn't deliver. Blah, 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 blah. And he's talking to the manager very patiently listening. And, 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 but but you, you could tell, you know, something wasn't quite registering. He's like, he wasn't quite sure what this man was talking about. He's like, well, yeah, but did you, did you open up the door? You're like, yeah, yeah, I opened the door, I unlocked it, I opened up the door, there was, it's just, yeah, yeah, but, you know, it's a suite, you know, it's, a, it's got several rooms. Did you open up the, the door to the bedroom? Did you open up the other door? The other door? They head upstairs. Sure enough, on the wall was a door that they assumed was a closet. They opened it up. And there is the honeymoon suite. The most romantic thing they'd ever seen. And it was everything that the guy had said. It was the heart-shaped bed, the roses, the candles. The violinist was still there. He was tired, but he was still there. It was the most wonderful thing in the world. They had spent their wedding night in a couch. While a few feet away was the most romantic room they could ever imagine. And this story would be so funny, except when we remember how many Christians live that way. How many of us Christians, we live with access to all the riches of heaven, and we are miserable. The father says to his son, son, 
You're, you're my son. You're not my slave. You are my son. All that is mine is yours. What's he saying? That goat that you, that you say you never got to celebrate with your friends, it's yours. You never got it because you never took it. But it's always been yours. It's always been yours because you are my son. My brothers and sisters, we are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. The, 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 the God who is above all things. Let me tell you, I have been so moved and impressed. I don't know how many of you have seen this on, on, on Twitter, on the internet. Photographs of Mars. You know, there's a little, there's a little robot landed on Mars taking pictures. These are, these are good. I mean, you're not talking about, you know, you know, Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, little grainy things. You know, these are, you know, high quality pictures. The surface of Mars. We human beings can see what the surface of another planet looks like. A planet millions of miles away, it takes months to get there, it's so far away, you look at that in the sky, it looks like a little point of light. My brothers and sisters, we have gotten the technology to be able to travel all the way over there, deploy a robot, bring it, get it to land, get it to, you know, get out the camera and take pictures and get the little instruments and blah, 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 blah. And as impressive as that is, God, you know, God goes, oh, God. guess what? I made it all. He made Mars and our sun and this world and everything in all creation the king of the universe the creator of the reason why we gather on sabbath because in six days god made the heavens and the earth the sea and all the things that are in them. this amazing powerful all sufficient god we are his children and all the riches of the universe But sometimes we get so caught up in, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to, uh, 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 and we forget we're his children. We forget we are children. You know why the Pharisees couldn't rejoice when the sinners were coming to him? They had never experienced that. Not a joy. It was, a, it was something you had to do. It was, you know. And, and, and there's so many Christians and so many Adventists for whom our relationship with God is the exact same way. You don't, it's not something you enjoy. It's not something you do. A lot of people, I'll be honest, let's be honest, and don't, don't look around, but let's be honest. People are here for no other reason than it's Sabbath. What I have to do, it's what I've done since I was a little kid. But how many people truly experience the joy of being a child of God? I'll tell you, if you know that joy, if you taste that joy, if you experience just a fraction of that joy, the thing about joy is you want, you, you want joy to spread. You want to share joy with everyone. They would have looked at those sinners and instead of saying, look who Jesus is hanging around, that must be who Jesus is, they would have said, look who these sinners are hanging with. They're hanging with Jesus. They're hanging with the source of life. They're hanging with the one who came to this earth as a little baby. And we sing about him. And he came and he, he gave his life so that we could become children of God. John says, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. 
that we could be called sons and daughters of God. My brothers and sisters, let us seek to taste that joy, to experience that joy, to be filled with that joy. Because a church of joy, you're going to have people beating down the doors to get in. You look at this world, there's not a lot of joy. There's a lot of all sorts of things, but not a lot of joy. Even when it looks like, you know, you're laughing, playing, having a, heart, you're having a good time, you know, jolly old time. Even, even, even when it looks like joy on the outside, you look at the surface, you look beyond the surface, there is not a lot of joy. This world needs a community who one of its fundamental characteristics is joy. I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. I want to charge you. 2019, we're finishing up this year. We're getting ready for New Year. 2019, make this your New Year's resolution. To seek, to experience the joy of God. Pray for it. Ask for it. Plead the Lord for it. Say, God, please, I don't know that joy. I don't have that experience. Lord, help me to experience your joy. Because when we have that joy, we, 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 we want to share. Now, I know we're in Louisiana. But we're a couple hundred miles away from Dallas. And I'm from Texas. So I'm a Cowboys fan. And please forgive me any Saints fans who are here. You know, I was watching that game with a couple of my elders at one of, one of my elders' house. I had to restrain my joy because, you know, they didn't have a lot of joy. Of course, you know, 10 and 2, 7 and 5. Overall, they're, they're doing okay with the joy. I am not concerned about them. But yet, yeah, I, I have to restrain myself. Why? Because joy, you naturally, boom! Ah! You want know, to share it. And you, got, you watch the game with a couple others who, who aren't experiencing joy, you want to you share it with someone. You want an evangelistic church? Taste the joy of God. And, 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 and you won't be able to stop people from sharing that joy with, with sinners. Seek for that joy. Pursue that joy. Beg and plead the Lord to experience that joy. Because this world needs more joy. I want to encourage you. I want to invite you. We're going to finish up. And our closing hymn. Go tell it on the mountain. Hymn number 121. But as we finish this song. Let's consecrate ourselves. Let's consecrate ourselves once again to seeking to, exp to seeking to experience the joy that comes from being in the presence of the Father, comes from being in His house, comes from being with Him and knowing that we have in Him everything. So um, let's go ahead and stand and sing. I invite the, whoever leads out the songs and organ people and all that stuff. Let's sing as we finish off this morning.